And to get things rolling, you're going to hear from the most energetic, happiest guy I've ever met, too. I agree with Jay about that. I spend lots of time with him. Um, we, we can joke a little bit. You know, he went to Harvard and I went to Boston College. And we're still arm wrestling about that. We haven't quite figured out uh, which, one, which one runs. But I will tell you that of the people who report to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, there are four Boston College graduates. There aren't that many from Harvard, Todd. <laughs> I work closely with Todd. I didn't know him before. I've grown to like and love him a lot. He's a terrific guy. Uh, he'll, he'll get you cranked up this morning on something that may be fairly esoteric, but let me tell you, listen carefully to Todd Park. He knows whereof he speaks, and he's leading us into the use of data in the future. Todd. How's everybody doing? Great. It's fantastic to see you. Uh, thank you so much to our sponsors and to, to Bob and to Jay and to Ned for kicking us off this morning. Uh, so excited that y'all are here. Thank you so much for making time out of your incredibly busy lives to come hang out and talk about health data and how it can improve health and healthcare. I'm, I'm Todd Park. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and the first thing that you should know about me is that my job title is, is a giant red herring. I don't actually run all technology at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I was hired by the Secretary and Deputy Secretary Bill Core two and a half years ago to uh, be the first CTO of HHS. And the job is to be a technology entrepreneur in residence. So my entire job, my entire mission on behalf of the Secretary is to work with our best innovators to dream up and lead major new initiatives that help HHS harness the power of data, technology, and innovation to improve the health of the American people. And uh, while my background is that of a private sector entrepreneur, what I will tell you is that the most entrepreneurial experience of my entire life has been the past two and a half years serving in the United States federal government. <laughs> and a big reason, a big reason is what we're actually talking about today, the health data initiative. So, um, actually, let me just, uh, let me pull up the presentation. Let's just do a little tech transfer thing here and hit Slideshow, and then go. Okay, so how many folks here heard about the Health Data Initiative? Holy cow, <laughs> that's like the highest percentage of any audience ever, because usually I ask the question and like, you know, four people heard about it. Um, so, um, so let me actually then tailor my talk accordingly and actually potentially not only give you the basic primer for those who haven't heard about, but also give you kind of the latest and greatest so you have a good return on investment of your time this morning. Um, so the Health Data Initiative is an effort by the Secretary to turn HHS into what we're calling the, the NOAA of health data. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's a super cool little agency I hadn't heard about uh, before I joined the federal government uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, but it's an agency that collects virtually all weather data in America and for several decades has done something even more interesting than that, which is it's, it's chosen to actually take all of that weather data and publish it electronically in a form that anybody can download for free without intellectual property constraint. That has then in turn fed a massive array of innovations in the private sector, like weather newscasts, weather websites, mobile weather apps, weather insurance, a huge array of innovations by American entrepreneurs that have both created huge social benefit, leveraging this data, and also created a lot of jobs at the same time. The government ran a similar open data play in the 80s when it liberated global positioning system data, GPS data, which is actually a government data set, which now, of course, fuels everything from uh, Foursquare right on your, uh, on your iPhone uh, to uh, super tanker navigation systems and everything in between. Again, government data being opened up, public data being opened up, and powering a huge array of innovations by entrepreneurs that uh, create huge social benefit and jobs. So the Health Data Initiative is a effort to run this same open data and open innovation play, again, but this time with vast reservoirs of health-related data sitting in the vaults of HHS, CMS, NIH, FDA, CDC, uh, ARC, et cetera. And basically, the idea is to release data, make data more accessible, educate folks about the availability of data, such that innovators across the country then take this data and use it as fuel for a rapidly growing array of innovative products and services that help consumers take control of their health and health care by getting the information they need at their fingertips, by helping employers promote health and wellness, help doctors and hospitals deliver ever better care, help journalists shed light on health disparities and key issues around which communities can mobilize, help local decision makers like county commissioners, mayors, public health officials make better decisions, uh, and much, much, much more. The underlying principle 
behind the whole health initiative is something called Joy's Law. Who here has heard of uh, Joy's Law? Joy's Law is named after Bill Joy, who was the legendary co-founder of Sun Microsystems and a legendary uh, figure in the Silicon Valley. So he once famously said, no matter who you are, you have to remember that most of the smart people in the world work for somebody else. Which if you think about it, is of course true, right? So our corollary to that is if you really want to maximize social return on taxpayer investment in HHS data, don't just have HHS and a small group of people in the know about the data turn that data into useful tools and insights. Have everyone in health and healthcare, while protecting privacy, which we'll talk about a lot, everyone in health and healthcare actually who cares about improving health and healthcare, able to take that data and turn it into magic that improves health and healthcare. So that's really the gist of it. And what we have seen in the last couple of years as we've been embarked on this initiative is that Joy's Law is definitely true. <laughs> there are an extraordinary number of incredibly smart folks out there, innovative folks, uh, who are taking our data and turning it into all kinds of magic uh, that is improving health and healthcare. So the core play is actually incredibly simple. So one, we're publishing brand new data for public access or access by qualified external uh, entities while rigorously protecting privacy. We'll talk a lot more about that. Um, secondly, maybe less sexily, but equally importantly, we're taking a whole bunch of data that was already public, uh, but making it usable. And what we mean by that is uh, a lot of the data we had made public was public in the form of PDFs or, or books or static websites, which to a third party developer is basically useless. So what we're doing is taking more and more of that data and turning it into what's called machine readable, computable data, right? Files that you can actually download or access via what are called application programming interfaces. But essentially the punchline is the data in a form that you can actually import into another application, a third party website, third party platform to then parse and mash up with other data to power useful services, useful functions uh, for consumers, doctors, employers, et cetera. And then finally, uh, because in our early early wanderings, our early explorations on the Health Aid Initiative, um, because we found that essentially 95% of American innovators who could actually turn our data into useful apps and services didn't even know we had the data, didn't actually really have a good understanding of what HHS even did, let alone the fact that we had this amazing data and we're making it available to them. Because there was that knowledge gap, we've been embarked on a energetic uh, marketing campaign, education campaign, uh, to market the bejeebers out of our data so that people know that we have it and know that we're making it available to them so they can take the data as fuel to build products and services to help consumers, help patients, help doctors, help employers, help communities improve health and healthcare. So that's really the core of what we're actually doing. So you might ask, well, what kinds of data are we liberating? Well, it's impossible to describe all of it <laughs> in the time that we have, but I'll describe a few examples just to give you a sense of the kind of overall gestalt of the data. So, uh, so one category is community health data. About a year ago, we launched something called the Health Indicators Warehouse at healthindicators.gov. Contains uh, about uh, 1,170 metrics of public health performance, healthcare system performance, like utilization of services, prevention, quality performance, uh, determinants of health performance, like access to healthy food uh, at the national, state, regional and local level, whatever level of granularity we have it. Uh, we're adding actually a bunch of exciting new metrics to it uh, very, very shortly in March uh, from the Medicaid program, uh, community health center program, uh, and uh, additional measures of prevalence of a variety of different diseases. And basically what this data can help you do as communities understand where you stand on a whole variety of metrics versus others, identify issues, identify opportunities for improvement, and, and plan where you want to go. Uh, and in keeping with the spirit of what I was talking about previously, it's not just available as a website, but also actually has essentially a, what's called a web services API, which is just fancy language for an easy way for developers to go in, extract that data automatically, and import into their own applications, their own platforms uh, to do wonderful things with it. Uh, a second category of data is around healthcare and human services providers. Um, so we've got a ton of directories of like who all the providers are. For example, a directory of all the providers in America that bill Medicare, or a directory of all the federally qualified health centers, uh, community clinics that deliver free and low-cost care uh, to Americans regardless of ability to pay, a directory of where all the mental health centers are, a directory of who all the substance abuse treatment centers are, a directory of all the elder care support services funded by the Administration on Aging that provide Meals on Wheels and transportation and support services to help the elderly age well at home. So what we've done is actually taken all these directories and made them downloadable 
and mass in machine-readable files. So you can actually import them into all kinds of tools that help people find uh, the right care, the right service for them, or help providers locate the right provider to whom to refer somebody. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, made uh, a whole reservoir of provider quality data that we have a lot easier to work with. So uh, many of you may know about our hospital compare, nursing home compare, dialysis compare, uh, data sets which, which we've actually had in the public domain for a few years now. Uh, so these are detailed quality and patient satisfaction performance metrics for individual hospitals, uh, nursing homes, et cetera. We've actually, at a new site called data.medicare.gov, uh, established APIs to this data uh, to make it a lot easier, again, to automatically extract the data and use it in third-party apps. So does everyone here know what an API is? Let me just take a brief, uh, okay, great. So for those of you who don't, uh, just forgive this brief you know, excursion into Geekistan, but an API is an application programming interface, okay? It's basically just a fancy word for a, a, a port that you put on a data set that allows a programmer to essentially program their application to reach into your data set and automatically pull out exactly the right data on an ongoing basis, as opposed to having a human like walk up to your website and try to hit a download button and then upload some kind of file. It establishes um, the ability for someone to build a bridge from a third party app into your data. So it's the way that developers like to roll, right? So if you want to exponentially increase use of your data, put an API on it. Next time you're at a party with a bunch of, bunch of geeks, right, if you want to become really popular, say you're going to API something. I mean, oh, people crowd around you and you still want to talk to you. So it, it, it sounds like a geek deal, but it's very important because you'll massively, massively, massively expand the use of your data if you API it. So that's what we've done with our provider quality data. And then finally, um, how many folks have heard about Section 10332 of the Affordable Care Act? Okay, so this is actually one of the things that, uh, that we're, we're, we're happiest about. Actually, Don Berwick said this is one of the five most important things he helped to do in his entire tenure uh, at uh, CMS. It's a provision of the Affordable Care Act that went live in January. And it authorizes Medicare for the first time to provide detailed claims data to qualified external entities in the private sector and public sector who can actually take that data, mash it up with other payer data, and produce comprehensive quality reports with respect to healthcare providers. Um, so you have to actually be a qualified entity, you have to apply and be approved. Uh, you have to you know, have experience in quality measurement and be able to handle data securely and ensure privacy and mash up the data with other payer data, run a process where you actually give every provider the chance to look at their report before it actually goes public and audit it and appeal it. Um, but it's a big, big, big deal because it's going to lead to massive new transparency of performance in the healthcare provider marketplace. Um, and that's important not just for consumers and employers so they can actually make the right decisions about choosing the right provider uh, for your family, but it's also critically important for providers, for healthcare providers who actually have been in the dark in a lot of cases about how they're doing relative to benchmark, how they're doing relative to others. And this will actually give you the chance to see if you're a provider how you are doing on a whole variety of metrics and be able to actually uh, set targets, uh, compare yourself against benchmarks, uh, iterate, see actually how you're doing, if you're doing better, uh, explore ways to get better, et cetera. So it can really unlock a process of continuous quality improvement uh, for providers in addition to helping patients uh, get the right provider for them. Um, so that's really, really a big, big, big deal. We're very, very excited about that. That just went live uh, January 2012, uh, meaning that qualified entities can now apply uh, to actually be approved by Medicare to actually get this data uh, and uh, we're off to the races. Um, another category of data is called Blue Button. How many folks here have heard about Blue Button? Again, exceptionally South Valley, but most haven't. Okay, so Blue Button is an initiative uh, led by the Veterans uh, Affairs Department, uh, the VA, uh, in collaboration with CMS and with the Department of Defense that was launched about a year and a half ago, a little under a year and a half ago. And it's an incredibly simple initiative. Um, so basically, um, it, well, the VA and the DOD, of course, run huge healthcare systems for veterans, members of the, uh, the military. Medicare, of course, pays claims for healthcare services for, for seniors. Uh, and what happened with Blue Button is about a year and a half ago, the VA, the DOD, and CMS, uh, for the first time, gave veterans, members of the military, and seniors uh, covered by Medicare the ability to go to a secure website, authenticate themselves, log in, and then hit a literal blue button and download a copy of their own personal health information. Uh, their personal health record if they were a veteran, a member of the military, or, or their own claims uh, if they were a Medicare beneficiary. Um, we actually didn't think it was that big of a deal at the time. It was actually very straightforward to do. Uh, we didn't really publicize it. In fact, we weren't really sure what the demand would be. 
So Secretary Shinseki, who was the Secretary of the VA, was told that if this were like a breakout hit, like a breakout hit, that maybe 25,000 veterans, 1,000 veterans might ultimately download a copy of their own data. Well, with basically no marketing, in under a year and a half, over 750,000 veterans, members of the military, and seniors have chosen to download a copy of their own personal health data, and on average, multiple, multiple times each. And actually, the, 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 the adoption has really taken off as more people learn about it. Uh, so it turns out people really do want their own data. And, uh, and interestingly, um, maybe even more interestingly, uh, as word started to spread about Blue Button, we got some calls from folks in the private sector. And the calls were along these lines. They, they asked the following question. Are you allowed to do that? <laughs> and we said, can you clarify the question, please? And they said, well, under HIPAA, is it legal for you to allow patients or consumers to download an electronic copy of their own health information? <laughs> we said, yes, yes, in fact, it is legal. In fact, that's a good thing. Uh, but I think that no kind of memo or guidance we could have possibly written would possibly have been as powerful as the VA, the DOD, and CMS just doing it itself. So now, actually, that message having penetrated that, that, that it is, in fact, legal <laughs> to let people have a copy of their own data, uh, uh, the, the private sector is adopting Blue Button in mass. So Aetna has Blue Buttoned its personal health record uh, with 10 million, uh, 10 million members. United Health is about to do the same thing. Walgreens is doing the same thing. Uh, McKesson has Blue Buttoned the personal health record it provides to 200,000 doctors. Uh, Vermont is going to Blue Button a bunch of its data for its customers. Indiana is doing the same thing. Louisiana is doing the same thing. Uh, so on and so forth. In fact, there's a, there's a fan site that's been created. Um, <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, called bluebuttondata.org, which is created by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, and uh, you can learn there about how to blue button the data, uh, and how to do so securely, uh, why it's a good idea to let people have their own data, uh, and make a public commitment, if you're a holder of data, to, to make a public commitment to actually let your customers get their own data too. Because the fundamental attitude that we have, look, is it's not the organization's data, right? It's not our data, it's your data. So you should be able to get a copy of that data. And the stories we're already hearing, kind of anecdotally, are very powerful. Like veterans who download their blue button data, print it out, and carry it with them from provider to provider. Because I don't know if you knew this, but about half the care that our veterans get is actually outside the VA system, right? And they can't remember, like none of us can remember, like who are all the doctors we've seen? What are all the diagnoses that we got? What are all the meds that we're on? What were our lab test results? So the veterans just literally print this thing out and walk it around, right? or folks are uploading it into their own personal health record applications or personal health management applications. They're doing whatever they want with it. Uh, but the point is it's their data, and they should be empowered to get their own data and use it to help power their own health and health care. So that's Blue Button. Uh, we're very, very excited about that. Um, another another uh, recent uh, uh, initiative is data for ACOs. Uh, does everyone here know what an ACO is? Okay, so ACOs uh, are, of course, if those, if you don't, those of you who don't know, uh, ACOs are the accountable care organizations are kind of a new form of physician organization or physician hospital organization that uh, under Medicare, under an increasing number of uh, private insurer arrangements uh, is taking on kind of global accountability uh, for the health of a patient population. Um, and so uh, what Medicare is doing in support of Medicare ACOs is to, is to support them in their efforts to optimize proactively the health of the patient populations. Uh, Medicare is providing data to these ACOs uh, in, a, in a really powerful way, uh, way uh, while simultaneously rigorously protecting privacy. So, so Medicare is providing um, aggregate uh, performance reports on a timely basis to let you know how you're doing. Uh, and if the beneficiary is okay with it, uh, the Medicare is actually um, uh, allowing the doctor uh, in the ACO to get a copy of the beneficiary's claims so the, the doctor can actually see what's happening comprehensively in terms of the health and care of that patient. Uh, this data can help uh, ACO uh, doctors and providers see how they're doing on behalf of their patients, identify key areas of focus in the population, pinpoint gaps in care uh, where you can actually dive in and do the stitch in time to get someone on the med, to do the follow-up someone needs, uh, to help them avoid the complication, um, avoid the, the trip to the ER that might otherwise have happened. So very, very exciting there. Data to help really enable the ACOs to fulfill their promise to be proactive engines of health and healthcare improvement for their patients. Uh, consumer product information, just a few examples here. Uh, we recently made um, FDA recall data, downloadable in XML format um, and mass. So XML, uh, for those of you who aren't uh, geeks, uh, is one of those other things that you can say at a party with geeks and get people very excited. Okay, so if you make data available in XML format, it makes it super easy for them to actually parse and use the data. So we did that with FDA recall data. Uh, we made directories of every health insurance product in America 
uh, in the individual small business markets, downloadable uh, recently as well. Uh, in terms of medical and scientific knowledge, just in this category, just a couple examples. Um, National Library of Medicine has been doing open data since long before it was cool to do so, but they keep escalating the level of their game. Uh, they deployed an API portal, remember the importance of APIs, um, recently that gives you easy access, easy machine readable, extractable, automatic access uh, to incredible resources like clinicaltrials.gov, which is like every clinical trial in America and many countries around the world, and it's constantly updated. Uh, Pillbox, which is this unbelievable new resource that has uh, uh, structured product label information about pills and tablets, filed with the FDA along with high resolution images of the pills, which you can imagine being incredibly useful in a lot of situations. Have you heard of Medline Plus Connect? This is awesome. I mean, I, I apologize for, again, going into Geekistan here, but this is really, really cool. <laughs> so Medline Plus is a site that's been around for a while that has continuously updated information written in language that patients can understand about like virtually every health and medical topic in the universe. Medline Plus Connect is a new service that's been set up where what happened is uh, the National Library of Medicine had a team that went through all the content in Medline Plus and mapped it to individual diagnosis codes, medication codes, and lab test codes. And now any electronic health record or personal health record or any app for free can send a query to Medline Plus Connect saying, I'm interested in basically these medications and this diagnosis for this patient. And Medline Plus Connect will construct on the fly a customized patient education package, an electronic form that's updated with the latest and greatest know-how, and actually beam that back into the electronic health record or personal health record real time at the point of care, point of service for free. So it's like having the National Library of Medicine continuously updated, translated into language the patients can understand, plugged into your medical office or your patient portal or your website for free on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's, that's awesome. And, and again, it illustrates a whole new dimension of data uh, that's becoming available. Um, and those are just a few examples. <laughs> uh, so I hope you get the sense that there's a lot. Uh, and, uh, and it's very exciting stuff. And there are really kind of two main channels via which to get the data. So uh, the stuff that's fully open, right, the stuff that's non-personal data, uh, like, you know, community health performance or hospital quality or uh, knowledge about, you know, uh, diabetes from National Library of Medicine, stuff that's fully open with no privacy implications is available at a site called healthdata.gov. It's a one-stop shop to actually find and, and, and locate and then download and access all of our free, fully open data. Uh, and then if it's controlled access data, if it's data that actually has privacy implications, uh, we can't publish it openly on healthdata.gov, obviously. It's available to qualified people through channels that rigorously protect privacy. So just as an example, blue button, right? It's not like you or I can go and get Mrs. Jones data, right? Mrs. Jones, a veteran, you know, can go to myhealthyvet.gov authenticate herself, go into her account, and then download her data. So it's accessible and liberated for her, and it's not accessible to anybody else. Um, so that's just an example. So that's very important. So two main channels, one for fully open data, which is healthdata.gov, and then controlled access data, which is available via, via particular channels to protect privacy, um, like my medicare.gov or my healthyvet.gov. Uh, but those are the ways that, that the folks are accessing the data. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, you know, making data available uh, to spark innovation isn't going to spark a lot of innovation if the innovators don't know that it's there. Um, so a, uh, a, 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 a lot of the work that we've engaged in is literally trying to educate uh, the marketplace that this data is available, is accessible, and, and, it's, and, and, it, and it's, it's a wonderful thing for them to, uh, innovators to come in and, and use the data to, to make magical things happen. So we've been doing this in a rather unconventional way, but it's been actually <laughs> amazingly successful. Um, we've been doing challenges and codathons, for example. You've heard about these challenges and codathons. Does everyone know what a challenge is in this context? So, a challenge is a, is a public competition, right? So, you you launch a public competition for who can build the best application that helps consumers find the right healthcare providers for them. Um, so, uh, at a couple of sites, health2challenge.org, uh, which was launched uh, with health2.0, a terrific organization out of California, and then challenge.gov, a bunch of challenges have been posted. Competitions have been issued. <laughs> Uh, to basically build X using Y data. Um, and uh, they're open to anybody and everybody. Uh, people actually throw their hat in the ring, build prototypes. A panel of judges actually at the end of a few months judges the result. And the winner wins, you know, a small cash prize, wins lunch with me or whatever, right? Um, and, uh, and, and clearly they're not doing it for lunch with me. Although I make a mean tuna fish sandwich and my Coca-Cola is very cold and very crisp, but clearly they're not doing it for that. They're doing it because they're really interested in the problem. They want to help make a difference. And they actually, if they win, can get a lot of recognition and potentially take it to turn this thing into a company or, or something big. So uh, dozens of these have been launched. Actually, mostly not by us, interestingly. Most of the challenges to build cool stuff, useful stuff, partial data, haven't been launched by the government. 
They've been launched by foundations and by companies who are interested in actually getting innovators to use our data to advance a cause that they care about. Uh, and the results have been really quite spectacular. Um, uh, a codathon? Has anyone here been to a codathon? No? Um, I highly recommend going to one uh, if you haven't. Um, have you seen the movie Social Network about Facebook? Right, everyone has? So you know the scene where Mark Zuckerberg and his roommate walk into this room, a uh, very strange room where people are like jumping up and down, a bunch of kids, and there are two kids like sitting at a computer kind of coding, drinking, coding, drinking, coding, drinking, right? That is a highly stylized kind of David Fincherized version of a, of a codathon. Uh, but basically it's a, it's a competition, but it takes place in a physical location over say a day, right? And uh, we've been working with Health 2.0 to do a bunch of these codathons. Uh, without the drinking, there's no drinking happening at our codathons. Um, <laughs> and they're still generating spectacular results. And so this picture, actually, I just want to highlight for a second. This is a team of folks, a um, team of young people from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they, uh, <laughs> they uh, heard somehow about Georgetown University's health data codathon. I don't know how they heard about it, but they got very excited. Uh, even though they had no background in health and healthcare, they wanted to make a difference in health and healthcare. So they decided to uh, get these matching uh, lab coats with these insignia, Team Maya, right? They ran a van, got up at Odark 100, and drove several hours from Pittsburgh to DC to make it in time for the 9.30 a.m. launch on a Saturday of the Georgetown University Health Data Codathon. Um, they arrived at the event, again, had no background in health or healthcare. Talked to a bunch of experts who were there, kind of resident experts, scrubbed into the health data, and learned about this phenomenon called food deserts. Does everyone here know what a food desert is? Right? So if you look at USDA data, you can see kind of clearly as a kind of map of Earth from space, you can actually see huge swaths of America where if you live in that area, you don't have access to affordable, healthy food, which is a huge problem from all kinds of different dimensions. So, I mean, there are whole kind of public health conventions about food deserts, right? Um, these kids had not been to any of the conventions. They hadn't gotten the memo about what's impossible. So they decided to solve the food desert problem in eight hours. And what they did is they had this brilliant idea, which is, seems incredibly obvious in retrospect, like all great ideas, and built a working prototype of this idea by the end of the day that won the codathon. And the idea they had is called Food Oasis. Have you heard about Food Oasis? So it's basically this brilliant and obvious mashup of text messaging and farmers markets. So if you have access to text messaging, which virtually every American does now, including most Americans in low-income neighborhoods, um, you can use the Food Oasis app to text in the fact that you want to buy a zucchini and five tomatoes. And your neighbors can do the same. And all those orders go to a central website where food suppliers, co-ops, and farmers markets can go to the website, circle the orders they want to fulfill, hit fulfill, and have all the customers texted back saying, show up at St. John's Church uh, this Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. and I'll have your food. Now, I don't know anything about the food business, but apparently if you don't need a physical store in the neighborhood, if you know demand 100% in advance, and if within two hours of you showing up all your food gets bought, the cost of food tends to drop. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah? <laughs> Incredible. Um, and uh, a major American company is actually uh, about to finalize an investment in these kids to turn their prototype into a product, beta test it in seven American cities, and hopefully turn it into an actual company. And the interesting thing about these kids is while they know nothing about health and healthcare, they're experts in what's called consumer experience design. So they're like ninjutsu princes and princesses at crafting brilliant consumer experiences actually work. Which you think about is, is a critical prerequisite to this kind of thing succeeding. And I don't know if that particular idea itself and its current connection will actually get traction. It'll probably undergo a lot of iteration. But here's the thing I do know. The only thing I learned about private sector entrepreneurship is the following rule. If you get the best people, you win. If you don't, it becomes a lot harder to win. The same thing is true of ecosystems. The same thing is true of ecosystems. If we can attract more and more of the best innovators in America to care about health and healthcare and engage in these issues, I have no doubt that we can invent our way out of any healthcare issue that we have. There's no problem America has we can't invent our way out of if we truly apply ourselves as a nation. And the key is attracting more and more folks like these kids to team up with the existing terrific innovators in healthcare to dream up ingenious solutions, test them, iterate them, and, and attack the great issues of our day. Uh, we've been doing lots of innovative meetups and conferences, like today, this is a spectacular one. And we've been doing annual health data palooses. Have you heard about our health data palooses? Do you think that any uh, senior government official would ever say the word health data palooza <laughs> in a public forum? 
data pollutes it, data pollutes it. Um, so let me explain what the data pollutes are. They're basically just huge festivals of awesomeness, is, is the best way to describe them. Uh, and they're hosted by Secretary Sebelius and the Institute of Madison. Uh, we just did our second one, June 9, 2011. Uh, and basically what happens is, is we send out an open call to everyone in the world saying, if you built a product or service that leverages our data to help consumers, help doctors, help employers, help communities, help journalists, help people, right? You're invited to apply to present your innovation at this Health Data Palooza. Give like a short talk about it at this giant Health Data Palooza in front of lots and lots of people. Um, in, order, in, in order to actually qualify, you have to not just be providing tangible value uh, to folks, but you also have to have a sustainable business model. Because basically, we're not interested in, 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 in beautiful concept cars that no one could actually drive, right? You can only admire but never use. We're interested in services and applications that are deliverable today to actual people to actually help them. So, so there's a pretty tough criteria, particularly if you think about how early we are in this. Uh, but even a, a, as early as we are, uh, June 2011, we were actually overwhelmed for that forum by the number of folks who qualified to present. So uh, we uh, tried to bend space time to fit as many innovators as possible into the conference, but we also had to do an American Idol style bake-off process where innovators presented via WebEx uh, and uh, a panel of judges scored them <laughs> to determine the 50 that we could actually fit into the conference center. Uh, I wasn't a judge, formerly I was an observer, uh, but um, uh, I was uh, actually told that I was starting to resemble Paula Abdul, apparently. <laughs> Uh, because I was weeping constantly and said, you're all so beautiful. And I was berating the judges saying, why can't you let this innovator in? They work so hard, they're so talented, I can't believe, Simon, that you are doing that to them. Uh, but fortunately, the judges were much more discriminating than me, and they narrowed it down to 50 amazing innovations that were then presented uh, on June 9th at this Health Data Palooza. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, if your faith in America is wavering even a smidgen right now, go to the Institute of Medicine's website Look up June 2011 Health Data Initiative Forum and watch video of this event. Watch as many of these 50 innovators present as you possibly can because it is the most awe-inspiring display of American mojo I've ever seen. Just absolutely incredible. And I can't possibly do justice to what they presented. But let me just talk about a few examples just to give you a sense again of the kind of overall spirit and gestalt of what's happening. So one category of innovations presented was innovations that help consumers take control of their own health and healthcare. So iTriage is a uh, startup out of Denver, Colorado, founded by an ER doc that got really frustrated uh, with uh, how uh, a bunch of things were transpiring that he saw. Basically, it's a super cool mobile phone and web app um, that leverages government and other data to help you understand what symptoms uh, you might be experiencing and critically find the best local provider and book an appointment with that provider. Um, so early in their history, they uh, downloaded our newly downloadable directory of all the federally qualified health centers, all the uh, community clinics in America. And uh, within something like a year, 115,000 Americans had found free and low-cost care at a community clinic through iTriage. They're growing incredibly rapidly. I think they've got over 3 million active users now. Uh, they hired 65 people last year. They have 34 open positions in Denver, Colorado. So you've got a niece or nephew who's technically adept, uh, you know, wants to live in Denver. Um, they're hiring. Uh, and uh, they're a great example uh, of how open data uh, can help improve access to care and also create jobs in the future at the same time. Um, Healthline's another great example, another great startup. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever used the internet for health search or if you're a doc that's actually talked with a patient who has, you'll know that the internet is a famously unreliable source of information, right, about health. So Healthline seeks to solve this by ingesting huge amounts of data from CDC, NIH, ARC, FDA, CMS, to essentially filter the content of the internet so that the results when you're searching uh, for uh, health topics are much more reliable, much more accurate. Um, they currently touch 100 million people a month because they power health search on uh, Yahoo, Aetna's website, uh, Dr. Oz's website, uh, the uh, uh, AARP website, et cetera. Um, Vitals.com and other companies like it are essentially uh, online shopping services that help consumers uh, pick the right provider for them based on quality and other metrics that are available. Um, have you heard of Patients Like Me? Patients Like Me is this amazing uh, website and uh, outfit in Cambridge, Massachusetts founded by Jamie Haywood. Uh, something like 130,000 plus uh, patients with very serious illnesses have joined Patients Like Me and voluntarily shared with each other their super detailed clinical and health status info in an effort to help each other get better. Folks with conditions like ALS. 
They won uh, Best in Show at the Health Data Palooza for rolling out a new feature called Trials for Me, where they integrated with our clinicaltrials.gov API and enable any patient on patients like me to automatically designate what their geographic area is and then see all the clinical trials happening currently in their area that could be relevant to their condition and actually subscribe to an ongoing feed where if a new clinical trial materializes in your area that might be relevant to you, you're notified about it. So you can enroll in it uh, and potentially, you know, it could save your life, it can improve your life radically, improve the lives of others. Um, have you heard of Ismopolis? So I didn't mean to talk through all these, but they're just so cool. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so as, I'll just talk through Osmopolis. Um, so Osmopolis is the brainchild of a, uh, a child of uh, the heartland, uh, David Van Sickle, uh, out of Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, what he did is, this, again, this incredibly obvious, brilliant idea, uh, which is he said, look, let's attach a GPS device to an asthma inhaler, and let's link that to a web app. So every time you use your inhaler, it records when and where your attack happened. How many folks here are docs? How many folks have actually treated uh, folks with asthma? So how many of you uh, would say that your patients could recall over the last week where and when all their attacks happened? Yes, <laughs> zero. But that would be useful information to know, right? Given what triggers asthma. So, so what happened is Asmopolis actually did this and then found um, a group, unscientific test, but a group of 80-something asthmatics uh, and their docs and said, we'll give you Asmopolis, let's see what happens. Um, the rate of uncontrolled asthma among these asthmatics was about 75%. Uh, uncontrolled asthma is, of course, defined as uh, you have to use your inhaler more than two days a week. Um, after several months of using Asmopolis, again, it's unscientific, but directionally interesting, uh, the rate of uncontrolled asthma in this group had dropped in half, in half. And it was because patients in their docs suddenly started to see that all your attacks were happening at work, or they're happening when you uh, walk past the cement plant every morning. Um, one woman, this is a true story, found out that whenever she vacuumed her cat, she had an attack. And I'm trying to actually envision the chain reaction, like, wow, what's happening every day at home, 5 p.m.? I'm having an attack, what's going on? Oh, I'm vacuuming my cat! That's what's happening, right? So, you know, you would think she probably would have realized that before, but, you know, data helps in mysterious ways. We don't question how. The point is that she's now better, right? She's now better, her asthma's under control. And here's the interesting thing. The interesting thing is, is that actually, if you bring someone's asthma under control, they're not only healthier, much, much healthier, right? You save $3,000 to $4,000 per asthmatic per year. Asthma is an epidemic in this country. We spend $56 billion a year on asthma, and it's growing at incredible rates. Um, and it doesn't have to. <laughs> and so there is a way, powered by data, with intrepid docs, intrepid patients, to actually improve health, improve care, and by doing so, lower cost. So Osmopolis is now rolling out in a huge, uh, scientifically uh, valid trials in uh, Louisville, um, in California, and in North Carolina. They've raised a bunch of angel investor money, uh, and they're a very hot company. They're getting a lot of from ACOs, health homes, medical homes, et cetera, who are very interested uh, in engaging patients um, and, uh, and bringing asthma under control. Um, another category is, uh, which this kind of flows into that category, that example flows in this category is helping doctors and hospitals deliver better care. So there's a whole, uh, a whole bunch of stuff um, happening in this zone, and, and you'll hear more about this morning uh, from uh, some of our innovators. But basically, one really interesting thing happening here is that there's a whole fleet of companies and organizations that are gearing up to help doctors and hospitals succeed as ACOs, or as health homes, or as, as medical homes. And essentially, they walk up to, to doctors and, and health systems and say, I'll provide you with, as a service, all the data, the analytics, the nurses and call centers, to turn you into a virtual Kaiser or a virtual Geiser. It's like kind of give you the muscles you need to do proactive population health management, patient engagement, and care coordination. Um, one of the most interesting examples of this, actually, that was uh, uh, on display at the Health Data Palooza was from Aetna. Aetna rolled out one of the best received innovations at the whole Palooza, and it was called a nurse. A nurse. Nurse 2.0. What they had done was, as opposed to using our data to build some kind of super fancy iPhone app, they built a very basic but very powerful nurse IT cockpit for the 3,000 case management nurses they employ in call centers across the country. Nurses who are now actually starting to work on behalf of doctors and ACOs and being assigned uh, by the docs uh, to help out uh, their sickest patients. So here's an interesting stat for you. 5% of Medicare beneficiaries, 5%, account for 42% of Medicare spending. They, on average, have five different diseases simultaneously. They're asthmatic, diabetic, depressed, et cetera. And they see 14, on average, 14 different doctors a year. 
So these are folks who could benefit enormously from having a nurse quarterback, right, who's actually helping run down field and block for them, right, and coordinate their care. And so these are what, that's what these nurses are doing. And so the example that they gave, those really powerful data palooza, was, okay, I'm an Aetna nurse, I'm sitting in a call center in New Albany, Ohio, and I've just been assigned by a doctor in Georgia to a patient who's 67, diabetic, depressed, about to go into renal failure, and about to be discharged from the hospital. Uh, and uh, basically what the Aetna nurse then did was pull up, as she's talking over the phone to this patient, in this example, pull up a whole bunch of information, a lot of it government data, uh, at her fingertips that helped her become this omniscient force for good to help this patient. Uh, saying, you live in a food desert, but look, good news, there's Meals on Wheels available, I'll arrange that for you. Here's the local best mental health help. Here's the local best dialysis center, I'll arrange for appointments for you and I'll also set you up with a transportation service to get you there. Uh, here's the latest and greatest nutritional guidance to provide you with. Here's the latest and greatest information from the National Library of Medicine to help educate you about, about what to do. And the coolest thing to me about that whole demo was that this patient, diabetic, depressed, being discharged from the hospital, who's probably in no mood to, no, in no mood to flip icons around on her iPad, right? is still getting the power of data and information to help her through one of the oldest and most effective user interfaces ever designed, talking to another human being. <laughs> so when we think about how to apply data, I encourage us to not just think about apps and software and mobile phones, right? Just think about how data can be placed in the hands of people through whatever means is appropriate to help better decisions to happen to help improve the lives of patients, right? Whether it be an app in the hands of a consumer, or whether it be knowledge put in the hands of a nurse or a doctor, uh, or whether it be information put in the hands of a policymaker to make better decisions, like what food deserts are happening in your area and what you might want to do as a policymaker to help encourage food oases. So a whole set of innovations actually aimed to help do that. Ozioma, local health data, you'll hear a lot more about this morning, an ingenious uh, driver, we think, of, of community health awareness and improvement. Uh, but but there's, there's so many ways to inject data at key points in the health system to help policymakers, doctors, nurses, employers, journalists, consumers, et cetera, take action, make better decisions, help inform what's going on to help improve care, improve health, and lower cost. And that's the kind of expansive universe we should really be, be thinking about, not just about kind of fancy schmancy iPhone apps or iPad apps. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tide of innovation that continues to rise. Uh, the, more and more data is becoming available. Uh, Secretary Sibelius was so excited about this, that last August she actually issued an executive order to every HS agency that asked them going forward until the end of time, every six months, to file a data liberation plan for their agency that articulates what data they've already made available and to whom, and what additional data they'll make available or more accessible in the next six months. Uh, the first plans were filed. Uh, with the Secretary uh, in November, and they were spectacular. And the amount of data, for example, on healthdata.gov is probably gonna double in the next uh, six months as a result. Uh, there are more and more challenges and codathons that are happening um, uh, all across the country, uh, sponsored by a whole bunch of different entities. Uh, actually, one of the latest is the, have you heard about this, the Cajun Code Fest? So the, the Louisiana uh, Department of Health and the University of Louisiana Lafayette is actually uh, holding a Cajun Code Fest. 2012 in beautiful Lafayette, Louisiana, and uh, 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 health experts, doctors, patient advocates, developers, geeks of all stripes are descending upon Lafayette, April 27th to 28th, for a 36-hour competition where they'll speed date and form pickup teams and then compete against each other uh, to build the best application that leverages big data to help build a solution that contributes to the fight against childhood obesity. Um, the, uh, the, the winner gets a $25,000 prize, big money, and also a free pass uh, past the American Idol competition uh, to make it onto the main national stage at the 2012 Health Data Palooza uh, in DC. So it's very, very exciting. Um, there are more startups, new products, new features powered by data launching all the time. Uh, there's a new public-private partnership uh, which has just launched, uh, led by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation called the Health Data Consortium. It's an alliance of folks ranging from RWJ to Institute of Medicine, HHS, uh, Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation, Consumer Reports, California Healthcare Foundation, Gallup Healthways, uh, a public-private alliance dedicated to advancing health data initiative, advancing the cause of open data and innovation, uh, leveraging that data. And uh, we'd like to announce, actually, uh, in case you were wondering, that the 2012 Health Data Pollutes, the Health Data Initiative Forum 3, is coming June 5th, 6th in DC. Uh, we'd love all of you to come, if you have the time and inclination. It's gonna be at the Washington Convention Center. We have to get the biggest possible space to, to contain all the awesomeness that is actually happening. <laughs> Um, and uh, we actually just opened up uh, applications to compete 
to get to the data pollutes. Uh, if you have an innovation, a product, a service, a program, insight you want to showcase, uh, you can apply at hdiforum.org, hdiforum.org. It's a very brief application uh, that you can submit uh, to showcase your innovation, your product, your service, your program um, at this uh, huge uh, Health Data Pollutes of three. Uh, and you'll be uh, entered then into the American Idol process and the panel of providers, panel of consumers, panel of communities, uh, depending on what your innovation is, will then judge you via WebEx at some point in April and May. And then if you've got the stuff, the strut your stuff, uh, at the National Data Palooza, then, uh, then you'll make it on stage and we'll celebrate you and uh, make you a rock star uh, uh, on uh, June 5th and 6th. And again, we're looking for the best innovations that are fueled in part by, by open data. Uh, also, registration to actually attend the event itself, if you don't want to present it, but just, uh, just attend, registration will actually open shortly again at hdiforum.org. And at the end of the day, the thing I really want to emphasize is that the goal of this whole play I mean, conclusion is, is not to just liberate data, because that by itself isn't particularly useful, right? I mean, you can't download data and eat it or pour it on your head and get better, right? Data by itself is useless, right? Um, it, it, it's actually to, 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 to catalyze the emergence of an ecosystem of innovators, right? A universe of innovators that are taking that data in all kinds of ways that we couldn't even imagine, apply that data in tools and services and products and programs that can empower consumers, help providers, help employers, journalists, communities, improve health and healthcare while creating jobs in the future at the same time. It's the ecosystem. The ecosystem is the deliverable. And at the end of the day, you know, the thing that really, I think, powers everyone who's involved is the knowledge that you know, th this ecosystem is phenomenally important. Right? We're not talking about you know, making pizza more delicious. Well, that is important, right? You know, but we're not talking about that. We're not talking about you know, making cars faster and shiny. We're not talking about making iPhones faster. We're talking about health and healthcare. We're talking about the most fundamental, the most fundamental issues in our lives. My wife and I were very fortunate uh, eight months ago to welcome a second baby into the world, uh, a baby named Diana. Uh, they're just the happiest, roundest, sort of, you know, cutest little baby you could ever see, like we all feel about all of our babies, right? Um, a month after she was born, I got a call from my wife, who was hysterical and uh, met her at a local children's hospital and discovered uh, after a uh, set of diagnostics that, that Diana uh, had a huge hole in her heart, a ventricular septal defect, um, about five by seven millimeters, a hole in her heart where there wasn't supposed to be a hole. So you think about how small a baby is and how small a baby's heart is and you think about a five by seven millimeter hole, that's actually a pretty big deal. Um, in fact, actually, in, in, in prior eras, it was a death sentence, uh, but today, uh, it turns out that open heart surgery can actually fix, we think, the defect. Um, and uh, uh, four months ago, she had open heart surgery, which was, thank God, successful. And she's now on the track, I think, being completely, completely well. And in the course of that experience, without getting into the details, uh, I learned firsthand just how incredibly important it is to have the right information at the right time. For me to have that information, for my wife to have that information, for my doctors to have that information, for Diana's nurses to have that information. And it's not a nice to have. It's the difference between a good outcome and a bad outcome, between health and sickness, between even life and death. And I didn't think it was possible for me to get more intense about this. <laughs> but I've become even more intense. Because every time I, I, I see a problem, I see Diana's face, right? And, and I think about her experience. And, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you have had this kind of experience in your family as well, right? And, and when folks typically have a health experience like this in their family, there's a phrase people tend to use, right, which you often hear, which is, uh, it gives me perspective. And that phrase is usually code for nothing else really matters, like my work doesn't really matter. Well, for those of us who have had such a health experience in our families, right, it does give us perspective, doesn't it? But it's not what people usually mean. It gives us the perspective that our work is even more important than we could have possibly imagined. Because at the end of the day, this isn't about blue buttons and XML and APIs, right? It's not about apps or data. It's about using every means at our disposal to help save and improve the lives of someone's baby, of someone's daughter, someone's son, someone's sister, someone's brother, someone's father, someone's mother, somebody's loved one. That is the fruit of our collective labor. And I know that a lot of you are here today 
because that is your life's work. I know that you've actually spent much of your life doing it before it was cool to do it. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I thank you even more for what you are about to do in this moment of unprecedented opportunity to finally make healthcare what it should be. Let us know how it can help in any way we possibly can. And as you do this work, this sacred work, I thank you deeply, not as the Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, but as a father. So keep fighting the good fight. May our data help you. May God bless you as you do this critical work. May the force run strongly in you. <laughs> and God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much for your time.